And we're looking at F. Matthew 22, 1 to 7, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Many will do that. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, fat and cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready coming Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. For all Israel did that. The, re the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their servants. Say, Jesus came to his own, Israel, and his own received him not. John 111. Jesus, Jer Jerusalem was burned in A.D. 70. The major reason for our Lord not bringing in the kingdom right then was the fact that although multitudes did re truly repent unto believing in the Messiah, to save them into the kingdom of God, many, many more Jews did not. The vast majority did not. All Israel did not believe then. The nation, in effect, did not re all repent. Even not even a majority repented, thus rejecting the offer of bringing in the kingdom by our Lord at that time. It was a question of the entire nation changing its mind about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, relative to trusting in him and not their own righteousness and entering the kingdom eternal life. Think of that. This reminds me of the new covenant, which is, it is. All Israel, house of Judah, house of Israel, they all would believe eternal kingdom of God. They be transformed the Jews of that generation. Private human beings live hundreds and hundreds of years to a thousand years. They will co-rule with Christ. They will know the Bible perfectly. Won't, nobody will be able to need to teach his brother about the Word of God, and they'll all be without sin. And the nation to, to whom Christ had given a call to repentance, reputed aid, that was Jer Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And the nation to whom Christ had given a call to repentance, repudiated him as God's heaven-sent Messiah, and continue to trust in their own righteousness, which is as filthy rags in Isaiah 64, 6. Matthew 21, 43 to 44, Christ said, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall in this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. This was our Lord's announcement of judgment upon those who would refuse to repent and had rejected him, and then in Matthew 23, 37 to 38, our Lord says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That happened. Christ announced judgment upon the city of Jerusalem and upon the institutions within the city. The temple, the priesthood, the Sanhedrin, that had condemned him, all would come under a divine judgment. That judgment fell in the year A.D. 70, when Titus and his Roman legions, as the instruments of divine judgment upon Israel, marched in and conquered the city and destroyed and dispersed the people. Pentecost offered this explanation. As we come over to the book of Acts, we find frequent exhortations to repentance. Peter preached, preaching in Acts 2, Proclaim the resurrection of Christ, proving the resurrection from the Old Testament scriptures. Notice that the content of the gospel is clearly proved to Peter's audience, which is mostly of Jews, and concluded in verse 36. What a marvelous Acts chapter 2 sermon Peter gave. Compare Acts 2, 36 to 38, though, at the end of his sermon. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has sent this Jesus, made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So convincing and convicting fellow Jews and his audience that Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Christ, was Peter's message. Not in view was Peter's exhorting to behave better or feel remorse or commit to a holy lifestyle. Repentance was what he is asking. Believe. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Believe us, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. In other words, they felt remorse, the other kind of repentance. Metamalomai which led them to the first kind of repentance, faith alone in Christ, Messiah alone, unto eternal life. 2 Corinthians 7.10 
In any case, Christ and Messiah, Hamashiach in the Hebrew, that goes defined as the one coming to propitiate the sins of the whole world by all the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist had it done right there. Here's that cross-reference, 2 Cor 7.10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we're talking about a repentance that doesn't require regret. Change your mind. If you don't repent, though, there's going to be sorrow. That's for sure. And there was in AD 70. So, okay. Peter said, repent. That is, change your mind. Change your mind about Christ. Change your mind about the person who invited you to repent. But whose invitation you rejected? Peter was not asking for sorrow for sin. It was too late for that. He was asking them to change their minds concerning the truth that he was had just presented, that Jesus is Lord and Messiah. This exhortation to repent and be baptized, although applicable throughout the church age, had its peculiar and particular application to that nation Israel, to that generation of Jews under the divine judgment, so that eternal and temporal judgment might be escaped by individuals who heeded the truth Peter presented and who turned unbelief in the person of Christ to belief. Same message over and over. Witnessing that faith, that change of mind by separating themselves from the nation that was under judgment. We find much in the same much the same truth presented in Acts 3.19, where Peter once again declared the glorious truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here it is continued. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And Pentecost goes on to describe. This verse is saying, repent and be converted or change your mind and be turned around from unbelief to belief. You can visualize this very graphically if you put the law on one side and Jesus Christ on the other. The nation Israel had turned their backs on the invitation of Jesus Christ and were marching toward the law, trusting it for their salvation. When they stood convinced that Jesus was actually the Messiah, Peter said, you must change your mind and be converted, turned around, turned around, and you must begin your walk toward the Lord Jesus Christ, away from that to which you were going a moment ago. Repent. From unbelief to belief. Well, walking doesn't mean ongoing stuff. It's what is what is in your mind, your attitude toward Jesus, you don't believe, now you believe. Repent and be converted, or change your mind and be turned around, so that the seasons of refreshing may come from the Lord. Thus we find that the call to repentance was addressed to a guilty nation in covenant relationship with God, but whose responsibilities under those covenants were not being fulfilled. John and Christ invited the nation to the himself so that they might receive righteousness from him. But before they turn to him, they must change their mind about their own righteousness, about Pharisaic righteousness, about law righteousness, about their need for salvation. After the rejection of Jesus, as if, after the rejection of Israel brought Christ to the cross, he still offered that nation repentance and change of mind as the basis of forgiveness for sins. Now we move forward then. Repentance in the life and experience of the believer. Pentecost goes on. We find that repentance has its place in the life and experience of the child of God. I would like to take you into the familiar passage in 1 John 1.9. 1, wow, yes, a passage to which we come again and again. If we, those who have repented under, from unbelief to belief, we, believers, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, not for eternal life. We're already forgiven. Remember that. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what do we get? We get cleansing in the temporal life. We may be quick to say, but I don't see the word repentance there. No, Pentecost goes on to say, I grant you, it is not there stipulated. It's not, I want to say the word stipulated. I'll add that in there. It's not stipulated. But what is scripture? Something for you to study what is stipulated and what is implied. So it is not stipulated there, Pentecost said, yet its concept is it's implied. Let me just write that in. It's obvious to me now. It is implied. Exclamation point. For the Greek word translated confess is the word which means to say the same thing. And confession 
is saying the same thing about our sins that God says about them. See, you didn't have an idea that you, you uh, were doing something sinful. Holy Spirit reminds you of that and says, confess. So say the same thing. Change your mind about not confessing to confessing. And confession is saying the same thing about our sins that God says about them. Repentance is involved in this act. How? For one must turn from his own evaluation of his conduct, which is he thinks he's okay, to accept God's evaluation of conduct before he ever acknowledges that what he did was sin. So you didn't believe you're doing anything wrong. Then you began to believe you did, and then by response you confess. And so in the believer's experience, there's a place for repentance, a place for a change of mind. If we are to know the blessed experience of restoration, not to salvation. Not restoration of your salvation, restoration of your fellowship with God, with God, through what? Confession of sin. You're not staying in salvation, you're staying in fellowship with God. You can look at this whole passage in 1 John chapter 1, which should be the very next thing a believer must read to get the idea how to conduct yourself in a Christian life is not to try to do better right off the bat and think that you're doing well. Yes, you're supposed to study to show yourself a pro and obedience and walk towards a faithfulness, but immediately you've got to realize you're not going to be a great Christian in this temporal life. Never. And especially when you first got born again. So you can keep confessing to stay in the fellowship. God can bless you and enhance your learning and walk by faith. It is in 2 Corinthians 7, 8-10 which we already read once in 10, that the apostle speaks at some length concerning repentance and relationship to the believer. You will recall that background. Paul had written earlier in a very strong tone concerning sin in the life of the assembly. He had been somewhat distressed as to what reception his strong language would receive, and he wrote, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. I do not regret it. I do not feel sorry about it. Though I did regret it, I did regret it, he says. Thus, a different verb form of the metanoia in both places, they so signify an emotional response, not a change of mind. Yet, now I am happy, Paul writes, now, but not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. See? Two kinds of repentance. Godly sorrow brings repentance, metanoia, and repentance change of the mind that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings to death. Right? Here the apostle is showing the relationship between sorrow and repentance, and he says that a godly sorrow that is a sorrow that is produced because the child of God views the sin as God views it will lead to a change of mind toward that sin. What he loved, he now hates. What he grasped at there, he now, uh, after, he now repudiates. What governed and controlled his life and became the goal of his life, he now abandons in the temporal life of the Christian, so that as he confesses the sin, he receives forgiveness of God and walks by faith better. Paul shows that sorrow in this particular circumstance in the life of a number of believers in Corinth led to repentance to a change of mind and confession of certain specific sins in their lives that the Holy Spirit reminded them of, and they were then forgiven of that and purified from all their unrighteousness. Clean slate, walk on, believer, my child of God, God says to you, and keep moving on and keep growing in the faith. If you're not, I'm going to remind you, and I'm going to continue to discipline you if you don't. Repentance.